For the last 12 months, I've done a lower volume, higher intensity approach, as is all the rage these days. I cut my volumes nearly in half. I took my intensity to very close or all the way to failure on basically every set, even sprinkled in some length and partials and all the new fatty cool stuff. But I have all the data to track and show that not only did I get significantly smaller over that period of time during both a surplus and deficit, but the negatives don't stop there by any means. So I hope to provide you with some insights to make sure that you learn from my mistake and make the most out of your potential gains. Now, obviously right off the bat, I am not saying that low volume, high intensity doesn't work for anybody. What I am saying is that for a lot of people, it won't be the best possible route, and there's really only one way to figure it out. Uh, I also wanna go through some of the science and stuff as well, okay? So the first thing is I'm going to walk through exactly what my training looked like for the last 12 months. So I essentially ran the only experiment that matters, which is the one you should run for yourself ultimately at the end of the day, which is inevitable after years of doing things and trying different methods, and that is to try this for myself, give it enough time to unfold, okay? So what I did was for 12 months, I tried different approaches to this lower volume, high intensity thing. I tried different splits as far as I even did low uh, frequency, so bro split style training. I did moderate with moderate volumes and I did higher frequency as well, but extremely low volumes, like two to three sets per muscle group in a session, two to three times per week, okay? I tried every different way to go about this. And uh, I basically took every set to between zero and two reps in reserve at the absolute max. For the most part, I averaged about zero reps in reserve at the end of every set. And what that essentially means is I stopped before attempting the next rep as I was sure I would fail on that rep, okay? So you'd get an idea as to what the intensity was like. And of course, I emphasized technique during this time as well. I made sure that no matter how close I came to failure, I kept my technique as close to perfect as I could. Obviously, there's going to be some deviation from that as you approach failure, but we'll talk about that later as well. Now, by the way, I also rested minimum two minutes between every single exercise, and that means all isolation, but then on the high end of like compound lifts, let's say hack squats, stuff like that, I was resting sometimes upwards of six minutes which also I found to be quite a waste. And again, there's a lot that goes into this that a lot of people are falling for in this day and age. I figured the only way to truly know the impact of this versus a higher volume, lower intensity or moderate intensity approach at lower rest times, what actually like what is this going to actually look like for myself? And uh, also the data behind it. We're gonna cover some of the data not specific on actual studies as there's tons out there already, but the misinterpretations of the studies and the people that you follow that may be uh, more incentivized to and significantly more biased as a result to tell you that data shows X, Y, and Z and that lower volume, high intensity approach is best because they are just trying to get you to listen to them. Uh, but not necessarily having your best interest or the truth's best interest in mind because again, they're coming from a more biased perspective. So nonetheless, uh, I was taking extremely long rest times because, well, if you wanna make the most out of this low volume, high intensity approach, you have to understand that every single set you do, now that you're not doing that many, has to be extremely high quality. And I have everything documented, by, by the way. I've got tons of footage of my training sessions. You can see the intensity level, which obviously everybody always argues on no matter what anyways. At the end of the day, unless somebody's arms are falling off, there's always gonna be some skinny 14-year-old kid who comments, oh, you had four more sets left, uh, you had four more reps before failure, right? Uh, nonetheless, I didn't take any deloads as fatigue management was significantly better. Uh, I'm gonna walk through some of the pros and cons and the good, the bad, and the ugly, essentially. And what I've changed my training to now as a result and the results I'm getting from it already, uh, and hope to provide you with some more insight as well. So I was progressively overloading and tracking all of my sessions throughout this time, as obviously you want to maximize your results in the gym, maximize muscle growth, you should be tracking your sessions, no doubt about that. I was tracking measurements and my body composition throughout this time very closely. I monitor my weight every single day, all the stuff I've been doing for several years now on the channel, and I was working mostly in lower rep ranges. So you can be rest assured that 95% of all my sets were between five and 10 reps, okay? Uh, once again, it is somewhat of a fad, depending on who you follow these days, 
to look at, hey, you know, going high reps is just a ton of fatigue for no act extra benefit whatsoever. Mechanical tension is the only thing that matters when it comes to hypertrophy. Yes, I fell for some of this stuff, which I will uh, actually be addressing later on in the video. All the timestamps are below, by the way. Um, so yeah, you know, mechanical tension is all that matters. Muscle damage, uh, metabolic stress, none of this stuff matters at all. So actually, if you start inducing any of it, you're probably just accumulating more fatigue with less stimulus. This is the wrong way to think, 100%. And I'll give you my case as to why that is, but first, Let's talk about the good that I experienced from this lower volume, higher intensity approach. This is actually my first time truly doing it. I was on significantly higher volumes in the past. You can check out my workout sessions to see what I mean. Now, the good, and some of these things are relative, but we can start with shorter gym sessions. Now, the truth is, is this really a good thing? Depends on who you ask. For somebody like myself in my position where I have plenty of time to spend in the gym and actually enjoy spending time in the gym so long as it's somewhat productive, uh, maybe this isn't actually a pro, but obviously talking about general population, if you want to get in and get out a lot faster and still stimulate growth, then okay, this is a pro. Um, there's going to be a very controversial one here coming up, and that is the next thing, which is the sessions are far less brutal. There's this whole notion going around these days now that higher intensity approach, and as a result, lower volume, is the hardcore way to train. But I think it's actually very obvious that this is not anywhere near the truth, and in fact, it just so happens to be an excuse to train like complete pussies, which is what most people are training like these days. I should add that during this time, I swapped out a lot of my compound exercises for more stable machine-based variants, okay? And just to keep that in mind, um, that also is a substitute for training more like a pussy. It is significantly easier to train to failure with a few length and partials thrown in here or there uh, on basically with much less volumes with longer rest times between than it is to train very close to failure with significantly more sets, more volume, shorter rest times, and having to have far more work capacity, generating significantly more output in less period of time. Yes, obviously, cardiovascular fitness is going to be involved to a larger degree, but even still, muscular endurance, uh, dissipating the metabolic stress, all these other factors come into play that makes training at that pace significantly more difficult, and it's not because it's just generating more fatigue, it actually probably leads to more growth for a lot of individuals out there. Again, more on that soon. Nonetheless, it's a lot easier to mentally prepare for a leg session that is gonna be like five exercises, two sets a piece. Yeah, to failure, no big deal. It's all in machines anyways, not like I'm that scared. And uh, the only thing that really ever gave me anxiety before this were leg sessions in my previous style of training. Sometimes back sessions as well, it really depends because they were grueling hour and a half sessions nonstop of absolutely blasting my legs. And yeah, it was not fun. I had to mentally prepare myself. Whereas with higher intensity, low volumes, yeah, it's not that difficult to do. You can rest plenty of time between sets because your goal, it doesn't really matter how much you rest, right? So I'll take the five minutes between a hack squat instead of the three minutes and I have to hit numbers on the next one that is significantly easier, okay? So that's another pro for a lot of people out there that convince themselves this is the hardcore way to train. Those people are actually just liking this way of training easy, more because it's easier, okay? Uh, this has been my experience. So with that said, um, very used to and understanding my own personal RIR accuracy. So this is a, another benefit is that I certainly am extremely dialed in. Not that I was very off from it before because I always train somewhat close to failure. But regardless, if somebody hasn't actually trained to true failure for say a block of training, then this will definitely get you a lot more accustomed to. And as a result, uh, a lot more accurate in determining what your true reps and reserve at the end of each set would be. So that's a huge benefit, no doubt. Another one is my legs seem to have responded basically the same. So I never really had high volumes, uh, or sorry, not I never really, I had insane volumes of legs, but my legs are a strong point. And so actually before I even started this approach, I was reducing volumes in my legs to a decent degree, but I was still doing RDLs, back squats, significantly taxing walking barbell lunges, significantly taxing exercises that were not easy regardless of how much volume you did for them. 
Uh, and so as a result, I didn't cut that much volume from my leg training. And because my legs just grow like weeds anyways, they responded basically the same, maybe slightly less than they otherwise did, but regardless, my legs did grow. So that's definitely a benefit, less, less anxiety before training legs and still much easier leg sessions and still pretty decent legs. But again, that's mostly due to genetics. I wouldn't actually put that as an objective pro in this for others, okay? Uh, but then again, for those of you who have genetic strong points, wherever they may be, then yes, a lower volume, higher intensity approach might be just enough to be able to continue growing that as you focus more volume and efforts on other lagging body parts. Next is more rest days and time off. But again, is this even a fucking good thing? Depends on who you ask. I thought it was good because I definitely was recovering quite a bit. And I had basically two days on, one day off was the majority of the time that I was training this way because, well, you know, rest days are growth days, right? Uh, well, I feel significantly better coming back to what I've been doing now with only about one rest day a week. And I always enjoyed that so much so. I enjoyed training so much that I went several years without any rest days and I was totally recovering fine. So uh, yeah, depends on who you ask. But again, a lot of people out there will enjoy the fact that you can rest more without compromising that much growth as a result, okay? Now, that is all the good that I've been able to compile. Let's talk about the bad. And this stuff gets really fucking bad. Number one is upper body is significantly smaller. Again, I've documented my progress across years, decade, almost a decade, or maybe more of a decade on my fitness pal over half a decade on YouTube. So I actually have visual references to, in several different ways, measurements for that period of time as well, uh, training performance, nutrition, etc. So I have a lot of reference points to understand and I'll go ahead and post some pictures up on the screen if I can find them. I took one actually a couple days ago to show what I'm currently at, but basically my uh, measurements of my arms are about half an inch. In fact, they were more than half an inch smaller at the same body weight because I'm also less lean, this is a huge problem. Arms for me have always been stubborn and difficult to grow, same with shoulders and chest. And uh, yeah, they were shrinking. And keep in mind, I've been in a perfect surplus, meaning gaining at a perfect weekly rate for the last six plus months during this time, getting stronger, focusing on improving, progressively overloading on these sets in the gym. And yeah, my arms are not only not growing, they are shrinking, so is my chest. And this is the alarming thing that came to my realization just a few weeks ago when I realized, oh my God, this low volume, high intensity approach is the only thing I've changed across the last 12 months. And I am literally getting smaller, weaker, fatter, and every bad thing that comes with that, okay? So let's keep going. So in other words, uh, measurements were actually worse. Waist is a bigger measurement while arms are a smaller measurement. They just cannot almost get past 16.15 inches, which is insane because they used to be 17 at a lower body weight with more leanness. So a significant amount of tissue has been lost on the arms. Now, I'm fatter at a lower body weight, okay? Once again, I have the exact same scale I've been using for the last six plus years. It's still extremely accurate and reliable. And yeah, as much as I don't care about body fat percentages, it's clear that there's a big discrepancy in the numbers on that scale, uh, about 10 pounds of a difference, uh, and it shows, makes a lot of sense. So yes, obviously my abs are far less defined at the same body weight, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going off measurements. Body weight, you know, a body fat calculator, actual pr uh, visual progress, and a few other things. Now, the next thing is one of the worst things that happened, maybe even the worst. The thing that I hated the most because I felt the day to day in a significant way, and that was constant joint pain and issues. Now, I'm only 29 years old. I shouldn't be having difficulty getting up and down from a goddamn couch. I was getting in and out of my car, getting down to tie my shoes was starting to become extremely difficult as I started having extreme chronic knee pain to the point where I could almost not bend my knees throughout the day. And again, my form was all fine. Didn't change much except I was going closer to task failure and in many cases all the way to task failure. And my knees started developing chronic issues to the point where I thought, okay, maybe I have just been beating up my joints all this time from, you know, a decade plus of training and now it's catching up to me. I guess it's true what they say when you hit 30, you're fucked. 
Um, well, that's not exactly the case, which I'll explain, but nonetheless, I started losing my mind over this. I'm being extremely worried because I thought, is this what I'm destined for for the rest of my life? Chronic knee pain that will only get worse. I mean, if I'm 30, how's this gonna feel when I'm 60? That's a scary thought. Another thing, lower back issues, significant lower back pain. Again, bending forward to pick something up, huge problem. Trying to move things in and out of the apartment, whatever it may be, picking up groceries, severe problems. Issues on my arms, my tendons, my elbows, hated doing certain tricep exercises. And um, I basically had limitations on the exercises I could do as I continued on this because my tendons were not agreeing with this style of training. This was something that I really, really did not like. I was even starting to think maybe I've got some sort of arthritis in my knees that I'm just gonna be screwed with for the rest of my life. The good news is that does not seem to be the case. However, we continue with the negatives. Lower metabolic rate slash energy expenditure throughout the day. And this is crazy, okay? And what I'm chalking this up to is the fact that I was actually losing muscle during a surplus uh, now, keep in mind, my physique was getting very close to maybe peaked out. I, I still believe I have a decent way to go, but I was very advanced before. If you look at some of the videos uh, about two, three years ago. And so to keep that up and continue progressing, uh, slashing volume in half probably isn't the smartest thing to do. Now, again, people will convince you that it is. Well, the more advanced you get, you have to barely do any volume because all you do is accumulate fatigue and that's it and so on. Uh, this is definitely not true, at least not for me and certainly for a lot of people out there. I'm gonna talk about the literature soon, literature soon, the literature soon to explain what I mean and, and have you understand it better as well because there's a lot of, unfortunately, essentially hit zealots out there these days and uh, they're taking over the internet in one way or another. They've uh, got you know naked posters of Mike Menser and Dorian Yates on their wall that they probably you know do odd things to each night and uh, that, that, that's it. If anything argues with that, then it's gotta be wrong or you're training like a pussy, you don't know what you're talking about, you don't care about science, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I've got some stuff for you. However, we continue the lower metabolic rate part. I was eating somewhere around 3,300 calories at the start of the bulk. By the end of the bulk, by the end of the last six months of a surplus, I and yes, I did cut it early because I realized this. I was losing muscle and as a result, and plus my training sessions were way easier, so I was burning way less calories, um, I did not increase my calories. I was at 33, 3,400 calories for the duration of the six months and I gained about 15 pounds steadily over time, which allows me to believe that I was likely losing some mass at the same time, which allowed me to continue staying in a surplus at the same amount of calories. That's a huge problem because typically, as I approach 210 pounds on my previous style of training, I would be looking at, yeah, about probably 4,000 calories worth of a you know intake that I needed daily just to keep up with the maintenance demands of it. However, something seemed very off in the fact that my calories didn't increase, but my body weight continuously increased, and I was looking worse and worse and worse and not gaining much strength, okay? So that's a huge drawback, obviously. Next, my strength gains were far lower. You can, again, look at, the benefit of this experiment, if you will, is that everything I have is documented for several years, and you can go back and see how much stronger I was on a lot of lifts. I even have the training sessions log themselves across years, and I was significantly stronger. Whatever strength gains I was achieving, uh, Maybe because I was using purely machines and going to failure, whatever it is, my body doesn't accept going that close to failure in every set. It gets way too fatigued, it destroys the joints clearly, and it doesn't do much for strength. But in fact, the data does support that anyways, that if you want to maximize strength gain, it's better to avoid failure for sure. Yeah, you might wanna get close to it, but avoiding it to prevent performance degradation in subsequent sets is gonna be important, but that's probably a big reason why my strength, plus the fact that I'm losing muscle, is down the drain, or at least it was, okay? I've actually switched the training for the last several weeks, so I have an update on how that's going to further solidify everything I'm mentioning here. Okay, next, my work capacity declined tremendously, and I only realized this once I switched back, okay? You don't realize it in the moment, and again, this is for a lot of people out there, they don't realize they're training like pussies for the most part. And again, they think that it's uh, Mike Menser and Dorian and all these guys. The truth is, is Mike Menser built his physique on higher volumes in the first place. 
and you don't need much volume to retain muscle for a decent period of time, especially if you're on anabolics. Dorian Yates did a lot more volume than people give him credit for because all the warm sets, I mean, just go watch one of the sessions. They are extremely intense because not only is he warming up with high, high loads and high reps during that time, but which you can count as working sets to a large degree, Again, based on a lot of the literature we have, it shows that, hey, you don't have to hit failure to maximize growth, etc. And he went beyond failure, if you will. So he didn't just go to failure. He was doing drop sets and force reps to the point where his arms were almost falling off. So there's a big difference there. And uh, what you don't realize is if you train with low volumes, higher intensity, long rest times, your work capacity, your muscular endurance, your cardiovascular fitness as a result and your ability to just get more output in less time, okay, more work density, if you will, or volume density, volume load in shorter period of time, however you wanna put it, declines massively, okay? And that's something that I noticed. Next, and the last thing, which basically brings all this together is I stopped enjoying training. I stopped looking forward to the gym as much because I had a contrast as to what worked in the past, how I trained in the past, how much more hardcore it was, and the type of physique that came along with it. A lot of individuals out there, a lot of you perhaps watching, uh, haven't gotten to a point where you're advanced yet, okay? That's typically gonna be the majority of the audience, statistically. And so you can see some great gains off lower volumes and higher intensities. In fact, I generally recommend that you start with that approach, again, to gauge your RIR, understand what training intensity means to a large degree, and you can work up from there a lot easier than you can work down from starting too high. Uh, but at the end of the day, I have that contrast and I stopped enjoying it. I didn't look forward to it as much. I was taking rest days, what it felt like all the time. And uh, yeah, it wasn't motivating anymore. I wasn't seeing any results whatsoever. In fact, regressions. So I hated it, okay? Now that is the long list, the long list of negatives. And uh, again, this has been all my experience. Of course, some people out there, this will be the best method for them to train in, which is slightly lower volumes than say, whatever the general moderate recommendations might be. And I recently made a video on volume that I want to address some of the things that I mentioned. Now, I involved a ton of the latest literature when it comes to that, but a few things to note. Number one is the literature on volume as it pertains to and directly correlates to hypertrophy is literally in its infancy still. People don't realize this, but because once again, one of the ways to position yourself as an authority in the fitness space, especially let's say on platforms like TikTok, is by uh, using PMIDs as fact checkers. And your interpretation of those PMIDs, those studies, uh, is what you use to make absolute statements that cannot be actually made to convince ignorant or the very gullible people or people just that just don't know any better, that like to hear the definitive, res you know, the definitive response, people that like hearing that, which is the majority of people, that is how you go about doing it. You make absolute statements, you use PMIDs to back yourself up like, whoa, shit, he's got sources, you know? And uh, that's not entirely accurate, and the truth is, is the volume to hypertrophy question or equation is, any, is nowhere near close to being determined. Nowhere near close. So for anybody out there that's telling you, well, actually we know very well that you can do X amount of sets in a single session to maximize growth and anything beyond that is clearly fatigue and a waste of time. Those individuals are likely just appealing to trying to be an authority, okay? So keep that in mind. Now, going to my volume video, I did include as much of the evidence as I could that we currently have on it. And I had to stick by a lot of the parameters based on those studies and the meta analyses that were in there to make my recommendations. So the recommendations I made in that video actually hold up pretty well, but I want to adjust some things to make sure that we're on the same page because I messed up on certain things. Now, first and foremost, I mentioned in the video that volume load is irrelevant for growth. Again, notice I'm using a couple of cherry picked studies to make an absolute statement to get you to think, oh, you know, this guy, no, this guy gave me a definitive response. At least now I know volume load is irrelevant because we naturally as humans like hearing that sometimes, okay? Um, but I think that it's actually more accurate to say that it plays a role in improving work capacity and therefore help you tolerate more volumes and recover from them better, which ultimately could mean more growth indirectly in the long term, all right? So volume load, my stance on that went on an extreme end, 
recently, as I started falling down this rabbit hole of what low volume hit, it's what I wanted to hear. That's the reality. The reality is, is I was at a point where after the events of 2020, my physique did decline a bit. I picked it up a little, but I sustained some injuries because I wasn't going about my programming very prop, uh, very well. And the reason for that is because I was trying to double my progress back to try to make up for the lost one or two years during that period of time. Uh, so as a result, I started getting injured and I thought, you know what, maybe I've peaked up my physique, you know, just conveniently, a lot of data started coming out and certain figures started popping up on social media that helped me start to create an echo chamber of things I wanted to hear to convince me that, you know what, I haven't tried this low volume, high intensity approach. I was always resistant to it. Let me try it now and let me give it a good try because this might be what I'm missing to maximize and milk out the rest of the gains that I have as an advanced lifter. Funny enough, it basically turned me from an advanced lifter to an intermediate lifter. But again, we're going to continue on that. So um, I just wanna mention that I definitely fell in the rabbit hole and I would say I did for the last about a year or so. I've made some content that might resonate with that. You might hear my sort of um, echo chambered, you know, driven thoughts in that and that's why I'm addressing them in this video. So the whole volume load is completely irrelevant, fuck that shit, whereas before I was like, no, volume load plays a role and we're trying to hit certain amount of numbers and thresholds and performances to continue improving strength, which will lead to more hypertrophy over time with a proper surplus and all that stuff. Um, yeah, I, I don't think I should have made as extreme of a claim. Next, I state that the volume parameters uh, in that video for low, moderate, and high. So for example, I think high I said was somewhere between four to six sets per muscle group in a single session, two to three times a week. That's still upwards of 18 sets in a week, okay? Again, I, you can't deny the data at the end of the day, I'm not biased enough to do so. Um, but with that said, I also clarified that that has to do with going between zero and two reps in reserve. So a higher intensity with longer rest times and those parameters will differ slightly or even potentially a lot if we start decreasing rest times and decreasing intensity, which once again means higher volume load, higher volume capacity, and it's an approach that might work better for a lot of individuals, myself included. In fact, you could say that it works best for, it works better for more individuals than the alternative. Low volume, high intensity works better for less individuals based purely on anecdote and observation thus far, and to my best recollection, than the opposite does. And that's why this whole low volume, high intensity thing just you know, caught the wave and has been blowing up, is because it's contrarian, it's paradoxical, it's polarizing, and it excuses a lot of people out there to train like pussies. I can't tell you how many people I see now that train, they don't do any compound lifts whatsoever because, well, too much fatigue, unstable, unstable. Uh, that's not true. And if there's a minimum threshold of stability, your body will create enough stability to be able to maximize growth on those lifts anyways. The basics are the basics are the basics. The barbell bench press is not a bad exercise. I've been saying that from the beginning, by the way, because I thought that's just absolute ludicrous. There's something that you understand once you gain an ex uh, enough experience that you simply can't do away with, no matter how much of a fad things are, okay? Or how convincing a fucking influencer on social media is. The bench press is not a bad exercise. The squat is not a bad exercise. Maybe there's more optimal exercises for some individuals, but for many, those exercises will allow you to maximize muscle growth to a large extent, okay? Nowadays, a lot of people I'm seeing, whether it's in uh, a membership or whether it's one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching, they always want to, oh, you know, uh, can I do this? They swap everything for machines. Machines are easy. They uh, take longer rest times. They cut a set off. It's training like pussies. You have to ramp things up a little bit to at least test the limit of what works best for you and see maybe you grow more from doing that. The last thing you want is to allow a dogmatism, a dogmatic viewpoint that locks you into one side of the spectrum and doesn't give you any flexibility. That's the last thing you want, especially as somebody less experienced because you don't realize you might be missing out on a ton of gains down the line as you progress and you can never change your stance because your ego won't allow you to because you just made such strong, powerful claims in the first place on that other side. And unfortunately, this is what's going to make a lot of these influencers irrelevant in the near future when they start having to backpedal on all this stuff that they were claiming. Luckily for me, I didn't go too far down the rabbit hole. I stayed as intellectually, um, I, I kept my intellectual integrity to a large extent, but I feel the need to address as somebody who likes to remain intellectually 
uh, moral, if you will, um, I want to address these things nonetheless to ensure that the slate is clean, okay? So anyways, that's a bit of a rant for you there, and um, no surprise, I'm known as the, the, the ultimate yapper for a reason. So with that said, a lot of the data right now, like I said, is in its infancy, but we've got plenty to suggest. Recently, the 52-week study, which was one that triggered a bunch of controversy, I do want to plug in, I highly recommend that you listen to, it's seven hours worth of deep diving in all of the data and the history behind volume versus for hypertrophy by Stronger by Science. Greg Knuckles, Milo Wolf, and Dr. Pack all dissect this for seven hours. There's a part one and part two on the Stronger by Science podcast. So I want to plug them here because listen to that and you'll understand things to such a better degree. And ultimately, to understand that not only does all the data, including I listened to another podcast with Zach Robinson, who's the lead on the meta regressions that uh, studied failure training and its relation to hypertrophy, which is basically the thing that every influencer took, showed the trend line and said, see, look, go into failure, maximum gains, way better stimulation. He even admits in, his, in the podcast that the limitations in the paper are insanely high, and or there's a lot of them, I should say. And that so many people took that trend line, which just so happened to be a, a way that they set the trend line up. There was different ways you can go about it, but because of the way they set the trend line, he saw almost everybody take it out of context and use it to say and promote their methods as the best. So you told you training a failure is best. Mike Mentor was right. All this bullshit. Uh, even the lead author of the study acknowledges the fact that uh, as far as stimulating reps, the five reps close to failure are the only ones that stimulate meaningful growth. That actually is not supported quite yet by any of the literature to say for sure that that's the case. It seems that muscle growth can be stimulated outside of that. Uh, and that is something that I mentioned in my mechanical tension video and in my volume video. So I should reference the fact that in the mechanical tension video that I made, while there is a lot of good data and information there, I may actually end up taking it down because I was once again stuck in my echo chamber at the time and I wanted to come back out with content, start making content again and it found, I conveniently found this sort of loophole to say, oh wow, I can get an edge on this and show people that, hey, they're probably missing out on all this stuff. But the reality is, is I was just leading myself too far astray. I was, you know, uh, uh, going away from my intellectual integrity and my actual desire in the truth. And I started going towards more dogmatism, which is not what I want. And I want to adjust that further. But nonetheless, let's come back to the fact that the science when it comes to volume for hypertrophy is not clear enough. The stimulating reps model is not the end all be all by any stretch of the imagination. And you should check out some of the deep dives of the science by some of these extremely intelligent uh, PhDs that have done a lot of the science around this stuff and uh, give you open interpretations of the science, okay? And allow you to come to your own conclusions. Now, I made a big mistake. So this is to end the addressing of the volume video. I made a big mistake in that I relied too much on the science to blanket and put everyone in the same boat or um, under the same roof, okay? But that is not being truly evidence-based. So, um, and I don't want to become one of the people that leverages PMIDs like a fucking fact checker um, just to try and convince people that my methods are the best. I'm not looking to create a my method. I'm looking to, uh, to bring together, uh, you know, use the science to help support some points. I'm looking down here because I have some notes on this. I want to make sure I don't miss. I want to use the science to help support some points, but focus more on the understanding that nuance exists. Obviously, working with so many people, I understand that. Um, it exists to a large degree. Science is still extremely limited. Uh, I have tons of experience that I can share as well anecdotally, and that does have merit and preferences play a role, and ultimately what works for some won't work for others. That's just the bar. At the end of the day, I see people on my TikTok coming in, and because of this dogmatism and this uh, cult-like zealotry of the hit model, uh, that it's just so convenient to think because it's like, oh my God, we've been wrong all this time. This is the truth, and it allows the ego to stand on, on a soapbox uh, to some degree. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to do that, and I want uh, people to understand, oh, to, to go back on that, people on my TikTok, for example, comment sections are so bought into this thing that they will actually come out and say, um, you know, somebody will say, hey, you know, there's more than one way to roam. There's more than one way to do things. And I'll say, you're right, 100%, but is that not obvious? And so many people will come in and be like, uh, no, LOL, there's literally only one. And they're talking about there's only mechanical tension, and there's only low volume, high intensity. If you want to maximize gains, and it's optimal, and this, that... 
uh, that is unfortunate to see because those people are more concerned with being right than more concerned with the truth and therefore with their own best possible results. Uh, but that is not surprising. So moving on, how does my training look now? I'm back to six days a week. My split is a push, pull, legs, arms, rest. Repeat, I will be dropping updates of my training, updates of my adjustments, my body recomp, which is what I'm doing right now. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit more soon. So I'm back to six days a week. One rest day feels amazing. Now, higher volumes, okay? I'm doing between 15 and 30 sets weekly for most of my muscle groups. I would say some of the leg muscle groups are a little bit below that, uh, but my arms, I'm hitting things with extremely high frequencies, like two to four times a week for some of the muscle groups like delts and arms, it's four times a week. For everything else, it's a minimum of twice a week. And uh, this is what brought my physique to its peak so far, and it's what's going to take me to the next level as long as I progress and program uh, accordingly within that. I'm still going somewhere between one and two reps in reserve at the very top end on massive compounds, uh, sometimes all the way to three or four reps in reserve, so moderate intensity, one can say. And uh, I am definitely doing a lot more sets, so my work capacity is significantly higher. It's improved since then. Actually, I'll talk about the benefits thus far uh, since switching from this in the last like four weeks, okay? I'm aiming for performance and hitting numbers across sets and across a certain amount of work capacity like I used to do, which is what got me the strongest I've ever been. Uh, certainly a lot stronger than I am now. And um, I'm doing higher reps, mostly between eight and 15 reps for almost all my work. Very few times am I going below eight reps, okay? And sometimes I'll go down to five, but um, sometimes I'll go up to 20, okay? So I'm doing the higher frequency I mentioned. Basically, I'm pushing back to my older style of training, but I'm keeping some lower volumes on my legs, and uh, that way I can dedicate far more volume, frequency, and intensity to the lagging parts of my body, which has always been chest, delts, and arms, okay? Now, why am I making this change? Well, obviously you heard about all the downsides, but let me also explain how uh, much things have improved since I've changed the style of training about three weeks ago, because it's significant. Number one, I do wanna address that my peak physique was achieved with this, 204 pounds at roughly 10 to 12% body fat. If you don't believe me, there's videos of me literally showing the physique, measuring, doing a bunch of things to illustrate this, okay? So I am far from that right now, though I am catching up. Uh, I wanna get back to that at the very least and then build from there. Peak strength numbers, once again, I was doing things like um, 295 squat for 12 reps. A beltless, like that's pretty significant with somebody who's six foot two with long femurs. Bench press 275 for paused sets of three, for instance. For me, that's good. Long arms, small torso. Um, you get the point. Deadlifting five plates pretty easily, six plate deadlift, things like this without ever really deadlifting much. Uh, so I was peak strength numbers while being at my peak physique, okay? Now, less joint pain. Let me address that real quick. My knees, uh, turns out I didn't have arthritis or anything. How do I know? I didn't go get checked. I just switched to this style of training, stopped going to failure for low volumes and massive rest times. And guess what? My knee pain is almost completely gone. In fact, in many days, there's it's just not, it's gone completely to where it was before. And I'm so relieved by that, obviously. My low back pain completely gone. My arms are healing up almost 100% now, and it feels amazing. So, safe to say that the higher intensity absolutely destroyed my body, even though my volumes were low. Now, another huge benefit is far more energy burned. So I've been recomping for the last three to four weeks, and I plan on doing it for probably the next eight weeks or so because I'm going to Italy. Uh, so I'm trying to, you know, get that peak physique going. Um, and my arms are already filling out rapidly. They're already up almost half an inch or uh, almost just over a quarter inch from where they ended at the top of the bulk, which I weighed about five pounds heavier than I do now. That's significant. Um, so it's clearly working and everything that I've set up until this point is only being further confirmed for me since I've started going back to my older style. But my favorite part is definitely the less joint pain. I actually feel normal. I actually feel like I'm 29 years old, not like I'm 59. That's important. Far more energy burned. So I'm eating way more calories at a lower body weight time now around 205. So I dropped about four pounds on a week to week average across the last few weeks. I've been holding for about a week and I'm eating, yesterday I had 3,500 calories, maintained my weight perfectly. On the weekend I had 4,500 calories, didn't gain any weight at all. Uh, once again, I'm burning sometimes up to 1,000 calories in a session, 1,200 calories in a session because the work capacity has increased 
and now finally I've caught back up to that. Um, the re repeated bout effect has kicked in. I'm not deathly sore, in fact, at all. In fact, the funny thing is, is when I was going high intensity, low volumes, I was actually sore more frequently uh, because this whole notion of, oh, you know, higher reps and more sets and lower rest time is just more fatigue and more muscle damage. It's like you realize that training to failure causes significant muscle damage as well, right? So it's not like one is better than the other just by that fact. You have to be careful for biases, okay? Clearly the muscle damage for me was far worse going higher intensity with lower volumes and higher rest times. Now I almost never get sore, but my numbers and my reps are increasing rapidly as I regain strength and muscle. So I'm burning a ton more energy, that's always a benefit. I'm eating way more food now than I was at the peak of the bulk and I'm getting leaner and stronger, okay? So uh, everybody loves eating more food, so that's a huge benefit. I enjoy it way more. As a result, I actually feel like myself again, loving the longer sessions. I love the intensity, I love the work capacity required, the muscular endurance required, the cardio that's involved to some degree, the shorter rest times. I feel like I'm just cranking it out, pounding up the volume and it feels damn good. And the results are coming in very rapidly as a result, which again, I will keep you posted on. So make sure you subscribe to make sure you don't miss out on how I'm uh, optimizing my programming going forward in this way to maximize gains. Now, science does back it up just as much as the rest. Unless you listen to closed-minded individuals that like to stand on a soapbox and create echo chambers, I think I've addressed this point several times in this video already, but it bears mentioning once again that the science is not, oh, it's only metabolic stress. Like actually metabolic stress can't even be fully counted out as far as having effects on hypertrophy indirectly. Maybe directly there isn't quite enough support to say for sure that it does, but once again, the people that come out and say, no, it's only one thing, there is no metabolic stress, there is no muscle damage. Once again, I did fall for creating that sort of polarizing content because it got a lot of views by accident, if anything. Um, so, you know, I, I did fall for that. I did fall into that camp of, of using the polarizing content and the clickbaity titles. And once again, I, I do wanna apologize for that, uh, mostly to myself because it wasn't intellectually honest and it's not what my mission is here, okay? Uh, but nonetheless, the science actually doesn't back up the fact that low volume, high intensity training is anywhere near superior. And when Mike Mentzer was saying all these, you know, these talks of him sounding super smart about it and so on, they actually had basically no data uh, around any of this at the time. So that's another funny thing. Uh, if you want more gains, you don't usually get more by doing less. That's an important point. Uh, obviously, there is a dose response relationship between volume and hypertrophy. However, it will top out at a certain point. With that said, until you get to the point where it tops out, you are not maximizing your gains more than likely. There's gonna be some exceptions for sure, but nonetheless, more volume equals more gains up to a point. And usually the lower volume, higher intensity group is not anywhere near that point. And the data coming out now to support it, for instance, the 52 week set, uh, the 52 week set study, uh, the 52 week, the 52 set week Set, oh my God, I'm messing it up. Anyways, you get the point. That study, and there's been a couple of other studies generally looking at, there was one of six months that looked at uh, somewhere around 30 sets per week, et cetera. They all are showing favorable outcomes for higher volume groups, which suggests that we actually don't even know what that upper end limit is yet. So that's important to know. Nonetheless, just doing much less than you actually could get away with and recover from is probably not going to maximize gains. Can you see gains from it? For sure, but is it going to maximize? Definitely not, and if you were intermediate or advanced like me, and you want to continue progressing, usually cutting volume down significantly is not going to be the answer. You might have to in some cases a little bit, but significantly, certainly not. Uh, so to a certain extent, it's, there's a dose-response relationship, it is nonlinear, but we don't even know what the upper end is yet. So for those who are out there claiming they know it, I suggest you be skeptical. Okay, now, um, just a few things to end off with here uh, for yourself, and hopefully you've gotten some insight from this video. I know it's very long, but I'm very passionate about this topic, as you can tell, um, topic when it comes to building a physique and better health in general and helping you do the same. Uh, so here's some insights I wanna maybe close out with here. Getting too stuck or planting your foot down in one camp is something that I've always wanted to avoid doing, as with more experience and actual intellectual integrity, you do understand there are many roads to Rome. There just is. There's several ways to train. That's just the reality. There's several ways to train and mo many people can benefit from the ones that you don't want to believe are optimal. Okay? Um, 
But I will admit, I fell slightly for the new science coming out and falling into an echo chamber of what I wanted to hear and help purport that as a result. The truth is I'm back to the style of training I was on previously with a new perspective. That's the important thing. I did learn lessons across this time. Uh, and with some new data and understanding of what works best for me, which is all that matters when it comes to the optimal conversation. What's optimal for you is the question, not on paper, because on paper may not apply to you anyways. Um, so yeah, um, with some new data understanding, and I'm going to continue to iterate and chase my best physique and health and hopefully allow and help you to do the same along the way. I do stand by the basic recommendations from my volume video that I addressed previously of three to 10 sets per muscle group per week, zero to two reps in reserve with two minute rest times is a good foundation uh, to build from for several reasons. Once again, better familiarity with RER accuracy. You're going to still see some great gains, especially for beginners, potentially some intermediates. It might be the best method for some and it gives you more flexibility and wiggle room to build off from. Okay, so some of the reasons I mentioned prior, but ultimately the fact of the matter is the following, and it's gonna be a hard truth for a lot of people to, to swallow. It was hard for me, but at the end of the day, I care about the truth, which um, if, if it's getting me closer to figuring out what that truth is and helping share it with others, then it's not as difficult for me to swallow. The truth is, is I sort of quote unquote wasted a year of trying to build a better physique. I could have had a significantly better physique right now. And um, it wasn't wasted because I learned these lessons, sure, but you need to experiment for yourself at the end of the day and find what works best for you. And I hope to bring you enough insights along that way to help you accomplish exactly that, build your best physique and health. So I hope that you found this video insightful. Now I do wanna know if you watched this long, please drop down below, what style of training do you prefer? Have you tried several styles? Which one do you prefer and why? Is it low volume, high intensity? If so, why? I'm happy to hear any comments or even have debates. I can even elaborate on some of the topics I covered in this video even further if need be. I'm more than happy to do that and I appreciate every single one of you watching, especially if you watch this far. Leave me a comment down below letting me know that you got this far. I don't know, put a um, recomp gains or um, let's see. Mike Menser's a fraud gains. <laughs> you know, obviously I'm not trying to jump on the other side of things, but just drop, let me know because I'm extremely grateful for you. I appreciate that. Um, last two things I'll close out for here is a couple of shameless plugs. Number one is the supplements back here, raw supplements. You want high quality supplements for cheaper. Get rawnutrition.com, code jmangofit will help you do that. Next, if you wanna optimize your training, your nutrition, programming, you want an app to track everything, plus my help and coaching alongside with you know thousands of people's experience, we've got plenty of members in there getting amazing results, you wanna shortcut your way to results, meaning at least avoid tons of trial and error, like I, I use myself as trial and error to help you avoid it, you can go ahead and do that for literally $1.56 a day, which is the best rate on the internet right now. It's essentially like coaching, uh, but for you know not $500 plus a month, you can go ahead and join the Modern Physique Hub. It's the first link in the description to get your best results ever. And I suppose to close out for now, I'll be bringing you continuous content as always. And I am looking to uh, up the frequency of the content. So as always, any topics you wanna see covered, feel free to drop them below. And not just on what the latest science says, that's not what my content's gonna, oh, this is the newest science, right? But also, um, I want to couple it with a decade plus of experience with not only myself, but over a thousand others. Some helpful anecdote along the way, my own updates, my mindset behind things, how I tweak, why I tweak, how I adjust, etc., And hopefully many useful perspectives and uh, altogether distill it down for you in a way that can help you truly build your best physique and achieve your peak health in the process. So if you're interested in that, once again, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Appreciate you for watching. I will catch you in the next video. Until then, I'm out.